maybe Tim could, uh, since Tim was the originator of this idea of what we're doing, uh, maybe Tim could uh, give a brief pressy on what, what it is we've been doing here. Well, my original idea was, um, you know, our society has no real receptacle for any kind of a personal difficulty um, that other, other cultures have many rituals for. If you lose a job or you get divorced or you have any kind of a personal crisis, basically your choices are to go off and get drunk and, you know, come back when you're feeling better or to, to go hire, hire a professional therapist and, and do some, uh, some personal psychological work. But we don't have anything like a council of elders that is just a, a community of people who are concerned for each other. And particularly when the coronavirus came about, all of a sudden Skip and I are thinking, you know, there's people all over the world who are really going to be grappling with this new reality. And not only the, the loss of the meaning that they attach to a, a regular working life, but suddenly being cooped up by yourself or with your loved ones and having to deal with with the realities of your own personhood which we very rarely have to have to confront and so this is a mechanism for us to get together and just support each other and to talk about our our concerns and our fears and um and just to offer a certain kind of support for getting through what is really the crisis of our lifetimes as a community. And it's, it's so prescient that this is happening all over the globe. There is not any person who is not going to be affected by this. Hopefully the uncontacted tribes of the Amazon will, will not be disturbed by this until later. But certainly right now, they recognize that there are fewer planes flying over the skies. And, uh, you know, there, there are effects in their lives as well. So everybody in the world is together on this, uh, on this one ship. And the, we have to realize that we are all in this together. And we, our health depends on the health of the people around us. And so we are forced to work together as a community. So that's kind of the, the impetus of putting this group together. And, um, and we particularly appreciate Paul's uh, willingness to, to speak to our, our current condition. Um, I really, I didn't get your, uh, your article in the Red Book until Skip sent it today, but I just read a little bit of it, but it, it looks fascinating to me, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Right. So, Paul, before you respond, uh, let me uh, just read the as an introduction to you um, the what's in the back of uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, because this is the genesis of this. And, um, and then... Among besides your article and your relationship with Thomas, we would love to hear your insights about how the world is going to deal with this epidemic, which seems to be only at the beginning. It's a tidal wave, not a wave. It's a tsunami. So it's going to go up and keep going. <laughs> and so anyway, today we're uh, blessed with the uh, gift of uh, Dr. Paul Bishop visiting us, and um, Dr. Paul Bishop is a doctor of philosophy, studied at Magdalen College, Oxford, and spent a year as Lady Julia Henry Fellow at Harvard. He has published widely on analytical psychology and its relation to German culture, including On the Blissful Islands, with Nietzsche and Jung in the shadow of the Superman. 2017, Carl Jung, 2014, Reading Goethe 
at Midlife, Ancient Wisdom, German Classicism, and Jung, 2011, and Analytical Psychology and German Classical Aesthetics, Goethe, Schiller, Schiller and Jung, two volumes in 2007 and 8. He holds the William Jacks Chair in Modern Languages at the University of Glasgow. So, uh, and that's in Scotland for anybody that might not know who might watch this video late, later. So, Dr. Bishop, the floor is yours. And we, we may have some questions, but we'd love to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you for this opportunity, which, uh, which I welcome. And um, I have to say, I'm always glad of an opportunity to, to, to talk with, uh, with the Jungian analyst. It's, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a strange position to be in, working on Jung, uh, in the in the field of modern languages, because uh, because I think that Jung is a figure who is insufficiently recognised in modern languages in particular, but also in the arts and humanities uh, in in general. Um, and I've I've always enjoyed my my contacts with with analysts who are approaching it from a clinical approach. But of course, there are also scholars who are uh, also engaged on approaching Jung from the the intellectual and historical side as well. Um, I think this was the context in which I, uh, I got to know uh, uh, Thomas Arzt, um, uh, and it was it was he who reached out to me a while back and and, and got in touch. Um, and I think we had two main points uh, of contact. Um, uh, the first of them was uh, uh, the Red Book, and uh, Thomas Arzt very kind and generously sent me a copy of the book that he'd edited, Das Rote Buch Zigegungsreise zum anderen Pol der Welt. Um, it's published in German. I hope it's going to be translated into, uh, in, into English. Um, really interesting material in it. There, there are some contributions in German, some in, some in English. Um, could you, uh, Paul, could you uh, translate the title of Thomas's book for exactly, us? That, exactly. That's just what I was going to do, which is um, his book's called The, the Red Book, uh, C.G. Jung's Journey to the Other Pole of the World. C.G. Jung's Journey to the Other Pole of the World and of course, he's picking up there on um, a, a quotation, uh, a, a phrase that Jung uses in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Um, uh, but actually, uh, Jung is using that phrase in the context of uh, what he saw Nietzsche's Zarathustra as, as doing. Um, and, and already, I think that shows, and this is really the sort of second point of connection, uh, which I felt that I had with, uh, with Thomas, and which I enjoyed, pursuing with him in the form of uh, conversations and, and emails, which is to say the relationship uh, between Jung and the, the German intellectual uh, tradition. Um, and, and that was the kind of the path that I had to, uh, to Jung. And I think that was also one of the things that, that Thomas Arts was instrumental in doing is, is helping uh, Jungians get a handle on that intellectual tradition, but also people who are interested in, in Goethe, uh, in Nietzsche, uh, in, in finding the way that this tradition doesn't stop uh, in, the, in, in the 20th century, but it goes on, goes on in various ways uh, uh, through to the uh, figures known as the Frankfurt School, um, uh, to Theodor Adorno and to Max Horkheimer. Um, and so it's a kind of a left-wing stream, uh, but then also there's this stream which goes in, um, which is um, maybe more conservative, it's maybe more interested in myth, uh, it's maybe more interested in, in, in dealing uh, in a very upfront way with the problems of irrationality, and that is to say into the tradition of psychoanalysis in general and analytical psychology in, in particular. Um, and for me, what I think was important about, about Thomas uh, was that he, his, his contributions were trying to anchor the understanding of the in the German intellectual tradition. But of course, at the same time, he was also wanting to say that that tradition is one which is important and vital and relevant to us now. And before this whole virus crisis uh, broke out, um, uh, I was planning to be uh, setting off tomorrow um, uh, over to uh, uh, Switzerland over to Eronos, where there was going to be the conference uh, on the theme of the Red Book um, and its, its relevance for our, for our time, which Thomas Arzt was uh, instrumental uh, in, in organising, along with um, uh, Murray Stein and uh, an organising organisation committee, um, and I was looking forward to the conversations there. But for me, 
why I was particularly interested to be part of this was because it was saying that Jung's Red Book is, in, is, is, is interesting for our time, is relevant for our time, and speaks to it, but also because as a kind of enriching of that experience, if one sees the Red Book as rooted in the German intellectual tradition, it's also a way of saying that everything that preceded the Red Book, the way of saying that Nietzsche, Goethe, other important intellectual figures, Schiller, Humboldt, they're also important and relevant for us as well. And I suppose that's what links into what one might call my day job, which is trying to say that it's worthwhile learning German and it's worthwhile reading these great foundational texts in German because they're relevant, because they're important, not just as some kind of archaeological exercise, perfectly valid approach, but it's a way of saying, well, that archaeology speaks to us as well, because as we uncover what Jung is doing in the Red Book, as we uncover his connection to the intellectual tradition that we find in the German language and culture, that's also going to speak to us as well. And after all, that's the only reason why I'd want to read these texts, because I think they have something to say to us. Right. Well, I certainly think they have something to say to us. And I, I was to be on a plane today to go to Ascana, so... Uh, so you said, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I'm very much missing that, and I'm very much missing... Thomas, because he and I have engaged quite heavily over the last four years. I wonder if you could address, just in terms of Thomas Arst, if you could address his, his the meaning of what he has done in the context of the fact that he was not a Jungian analyst, but he was the instigator uh, with Murray Stein of putting this uh, series together. And I, I try to be as gentle as possible and respectful as possible of Murray, but I recall being uh, quite angry with Murray in 2015 when I saw a video which is online uh, called uh, something like uh, Jung and the Christian Debate, Jung and Christianity Debate. And Murray at that time was rather dismissive of the idea. He said, you know, who, who would even do it? Um, and and uh, I, I see his point, but he was saying, you know, out of, out of uh, all the 3,000 Jungian analysts in the world, maybe 50 have enough knowledge of Christianity and to uh, even engage in that debate. And perhaps 10 would write about it and only two would actually do anything <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he was rather dismissive about the idea of a, of a quote-unquote debate between Christianity and uh, Jungian psychology. Um, and so I, I was pretty upset by that. But um, then the series came along, and I read Thomas's article, and I thought it was profound, actually, his essay in the same book that you appear in the same volume that your essay appears. And um, I realized that Thomas was not a Jungian analyst, as I am mm -hmm. not. And I'm, I'm not professionally trained in psychology at all. I've never taken a psychology course. But I've been studying Jung since 1987. <laughs> and it tur it's turned out to be... Um, you know, my lifeline, actually, it's been my mental yeah. health lifeline. And, and uh, he, you know, Jung became my shrink, basically, uh, over time, right, uh, by reading his work, and pulled me out of a lot of crises, uh, personal crises, um, including one where my daughter in 1998, or 99, I forget exactly, 98, I think, told me that she thought I was going to hell. Um, and um, it's a long story, but suffice it to say that that evening driving home from that dinner with her, uh, I had a vision of Mephistopheles plopping into my car with me. And I had to, I cut the Faustian bargain, which was uh, he could have my immortal soul on my death, provided none of my daughters would think that of me for the rest of my life. And uh, he disappeared and hasn't come back. But, um, but you know, so 
I knew, I, I now know how pastors were scaring people into Christianity since forever. Mm. And, mm. and uh, I wonder if you'd co comment on that because my work has all been, my work since 2010 and doing the Archetype in Action website and now since 2016 doing this YouTube channel has all mm -hmm. been because I think that lots of laymen who can't either find a Jungian analyst or who uh, can't afford a Jungian analyst or in my case I approached a couple of Jungian analysts and I was told they were afraid of me uh, one of whom had never read the Red Book and so I wonder if you'd comment on Thomas's role in that if you have an opinion. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. No, no, I'd be glad to. I think uh, I think the first comment would be would be um, keep keep your car window shut when you drive. That'll stop <laughs> Mephisto from coming in. But, um, uh, but 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 I guess you're right. I think I think I think everybody in in some way or another um, uh, cuts the cuts the Faustian bargain. And of course, of course, that that's why Faust is such a such a central uh, uh, figure. Um, I, I suppose it's it's particularly. Uh, uh, poignant or touching or uh, or appropriate um, in that um, uh, that Faust is of course um, an, an academic figure um, and uh, I, I think part, part of it is Goethe having a little bit of fun um, at the academic's expense um, uh, both in the general conception of Faust of Faust one when the aged Faust is there um, absolutely fed up to the back teeth uh, has done all this studying has immersed himself in all this learning um, and it hasn't got him anywhere um, at, at all, um, and it, it, it drives him um, to distraction. And of course, it's going to drive him to uh, to, to suicide, um, at which he would commit did if he did not hear the the bells of um, appropriately enough at Easter Day, and that that's a temporary rescue for him. And I think that's one of the ways in which Goethe is trying to say, well, a, a Christianity does have a role to play in in saving us, uh, whatever that means. It's something that we've culturally in, in, inherited. Um, and is therefore part of our psyche as well. But of course, um, one can't see Goethe's Faust as a, a Christian text by any means. Um, it's a, a parody of a Christian text in some ways, certainly at the end of, of part two, in that notorious scene when, when, uh, when Faust is rescued. Faust, who has done all these wrong and terrible things, is nevertheless rescued. And, and so that is a bit of a slap in the face to, to, to orthodox uh, the Christianity. And Goethe is very well aware of that. And he drives the message home by turning the final scene into a parody uh, of uh, Dante's Paradise. Um, but I think the point is, it's, it's that Goethe is trying to say Christianity is not enough. And that's why this extra form comes in of uh, the... Um, uh, the deal that he cuts with with Mephistopheles, um, that of course only makes sense. The whole figure of Mephisto only makes sense within a Christian context. So it's not as if Christianity is being junked. And I think Goethe's point is well, you can't junk it. It's something that we've that we've inherited. This idea of inheritance is very important for Jung, very important for Goethe explicitly as a word uh, in Faust Part One as uh, as well. But it's not sufficient. Uh, or it, it cannot be taken at face value. It's going to be problematic in some in, in some way because what is the pact with with Mephisto is that it's going to enable Faust to go out into the world. And so he goes out into the world in a commercial sense, in a political sense, uh, in an erotic sense, uh, in the relationship with with Gretchen, uh, in in a historical sense, traveling through time. Uh, he's the first kind of Doctor Who figure, if you like, in uh, part two, as he goes back to the ancient Greek world, has all his adventures there and, and so on. And then finally, as the businessman uh, in, in part two. And the reason why I hope that's a, a, an answer to, or beginning of an answer to your, to your question, is because I think that, that, that Thomas was, was very aware of the, the importance and the relevance of um, uh, the, the German tradition, Weimar classicism, if you want, if you want to call it that, uh, but the great pioneering thinkers uh, in literature like like Goethe, in theatre like uh, like Schiller, Goethe too, uh, and and in science. And of course, Goethe has an important scientific aspect to him as well. Humboldt, um, the Humboldt brothers, between them, uh, as as great researchers, historians, naturists, and so on, linguists. And, and, and what I found important in talking about Thomas was his sense that this was a real, live, vital culture 
um, that spoke to us. And it, it's one into which uh, Jung fits as, as well as someone who uh, in, inherits for his own part this tradition in some ways, and I think very explicitly as far as Goethe is concerned, uh, he tries to refer to back to that. In fact, I'd, I'd, I'd much prefer to, to be part of a dialogue and discussions and, uh, and, and, and questions, because I think, I think that's actually the way in which Thomas worked as, as well, by, by, by bringing different disciplines, different approaches into a conversation with each other. And of course, that's one of the reasons why Eronos uh, is such a great city, uh, such a great setting for the, for the conference that was planned, where people are coming from different disciplines. And of course, that was the original idea of the Eronos conferences as, as set out, right. that everybody would bring, bring a different uh, discursive ingredient uh, to the intellectual meal. So let me uh, just uh, introduce you to our very uh, international group here. Um, we have uh, Cynthia Day, who's from Vermont. We have uh, Tim, who is my co-founder of this effort, uh, who is in Montana. Uh, Miles Flagg is in Calgary, Canada. Uh, Sandy Ansari is uh, in um, in San Diego, uh, San, from San Diego, I believe, but who is um, was born in Iran, and uh, she's going to tell her story of escaping from Iran at age 10 this Saturday evening, our time. And Jerome is in North Carolina. Mirtz Oliveira is in Brazil. Uh, Kushbu Kantaria is uh, from Bangalore, India. And uh, Joss, Bear, Joss Sanglang is from uh, Hawaii. So we have quite a extended group and and then you from the uk so right that's right it is Did the whole world that's brilliant. yeah so go ahead nancy well i just wanted to be mentioned in it as, as oh i'm sorry I, I i i miss nancy i uh that was that was a definitely a blanking out nancy has a master's degree in christian spirituality and uh we often talk. Uh, we there are there are uh, five interviews that I did with Nancy last fall, uh, which on the homepage of this YouTube channel are referred to in a playlist called uh, "A Christian Individuation," and mm. uh, we had quite an, a moving uh, seven and a half hours of discussion there about her whole life and and how she came through as a Christian. And uh, so anyway, um, but I'm going to shut up. Please, others, uh, speak up and ask your questions. Hey, Paul, I was really intrigued with this idea that uh, the society needs to open up to the madness of the world. Mm. Um, and it seems like this is a perfect opportunity to do that. Could you speak about that a little bit? Sure. Well, no, thank, thank, thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Um, I suppose one of the things that struck me over the, over the last few weeks is um, with, with a kind of a sense of shock as, as, as in some ways everything's changed, uh, but in some way uh, nothing has changed. Um, I've just come out um, today before coming and speaking with, with you from doing um, uh, honours, uh, oral examinations uh, online. Um, I, I sit here, I can see uh, coming into my university uh, email inbox, um, more messages and emails and invitations to Zoom meetings for university committees and, and so on. Um, uh, and, and I'm actually able to go shopping and so on. Um, uh, and, and what I'm struck with uh, is the sense that what we shouldn't think was what we had before was normal. Because if there's anything that I take from Jung, uh, which is quite a bit, it is the insistence, and I think that's part of the message of the Red Book, that what we had before was not normal. Uh, we might have been used to it, um, but it's tied up with the whole thesis, which we find... I think in two, two sides of the German tradition, with the Frankfurt School uh, and with psychoanalysis, which is that modernity itself is a form of madness. 
Um, and it's, it's unusual, I think, for people to bring the Frankfurt School and Jungian psychology uh, together. Um, and in fact, that was one of the things that I was wanting to talk about in the uh, uh, Red Bull conference in, in Eronos. But I think there are very important connections, very important uh, similar similarities in the conclusions that they, that they come to. Um, the whole point about the Enlightenment for, for Adorno and Horkheimer is, as they say, um, it, it is a dialectic that, that myth and madness on the one hand and enlightenment and rationality on the other are not opposites, but are inextricably uh, interrelated. And I think that's the whole basis for their critique of the enlightenment and the, and the modern forms of society which emerge from the enlightenment is that they say, we might think we're being rational, we might think that we're enlightened, but in fact, we're getting, we're getting more and more dragged down in different forms of ir irrationality, different forms, if you like, of, uh, of myth. And, and they value the myth and the irrational as something uh, negative. And I think if you look at, um, uh, um, at, on the other hand, at psychoanalysis and, and Jung in, in particular, you find a very similar structure of, of argument, which is that behind uh, rationality, there is the irrational. Um, even though we think we're being very organized and enlightened and rational, that there is something deeply irrational, libidinal, if you like, uh, uh, in Freudian terms or in Jungian terms, uh, which is driving us. Um, and the difference is, is that what is seen as a risk to the Enlightenment project by the Frankfurt School is seen by psychoanalysis, and Jung in particular, as an opportunity. And that is why myth is something which, as we know, is positively valued uh, within a Jungian context, not in an unqualified way, because there's always the danger, think of that descent that we take to the underworld in the form of the Nekia, there's always the danger that we might get caught there. But we have to go down in order for us to be able to come up again. So does that kind of answer the question in some way, what you, what you were asking, Tim? Yes, and it makes me wonder um, how the society in general can, can look for opportunities for that. Um, I think we have such a great advantage in that we understand the concepts of Jung and how important myth is for the, for the modern soul. But uh, I, I'm kind of at a loss for how to, um, to encourage that kind of thinking just out in, the, out in the world. And as an artist, I'm putting out images all the time, but, hmm. but a lot of them just fall flat because there's so little respect for the idea of there being an underlying reality that is more numinous and more, um, more uh, luminous, I guess, than our, than our own kind of myopic world. Yeah. Well, well no, I, I, I share your sense of uh, apprehension of the, uh, the task that one, one, one faces, uh, uh, Tim. Um, and, and I suppose I think of two things. First of all, uh, Goethe says uh, about his own writings, he says that they're never going to become popular. Meine Sachen können nicht popular werden. They're, they're never going to become popular. Um, and, and, and there is a sense that even though he might be the great figure of Weimar classicism, and there's Weimar, and there's statues in Goethe, wherever you go, um, is, is that he, he, he isn't popular in, 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 in that sense that he means it. Um, and of course, there is also... He's, well, he's a great contested figure, and no more, no, no, no more than now, because if we were looking for someone who epitomizes, as it were, the, the dead white male, uh, then, then Goethe would be, would be a figure of that. Um, that's not to say that he's not important to the reasons that we were talking about uh, earlier. Um, and, and, and going back even further, think of the basic example of Plato's uh, allegory of the cave. Um, the whole point of the allegory of the cave is to is, is as a, a kind of pedagogical warning to the person who manages to get out of the cave is that they are going to have a hell of a time when they go back into the cave again, as they have to do. And, and Socrates is very clear on this, that the person who gets out sees the magic wonder world up above, which is the reality, has to go back down into the cave. He has to do that and speak to the people who are trapped in there, but he also uh, drives home the message that the man who returns is not gonna be listened to. He's gonna be laughed at, he's gonna be mocked, and says Plato, um, uh, if these people 
who are sitting there with their arms bound together watching these flipping images, if they could get their hands on this person, says Plato, they, they would kill him. Uh, so you don't get much more unpopular than having people trying to kill you. <laughs> uh, yes, um, I, 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 I want to talk about myth for a moment. Um, first of all, I just see that Sandy's waving her hand. She wanted to say something next. Okay, Sandy, your turn. Is that all right? Yeah, go ahead. I, oh. I'll come back to my question. Uh, yeah. Dr. Bishop, I was just wondering why you um, chose the, um, the, the scholars that you chose for the paper um, in order to talk about madness and, you know, creativity. Uh, and I actually, I am a psychoanalyst, so I, mm -hmm. I'm familiar with Nietzsche's, you know, influence on, on psychoanalysis and particularly Freud. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I can understand that. Um, uh, but I wanted to hear a little bit more about, you know, why you chose, you know, Schelling and Goethe mm -hmm. and Nietzsche and Plato for, mm -hmm. to kind of construct this mm -hmm. concept for us. Okay, no, no th th thanks very much for that question, Sandy. Um, I, uh, I, I suppose my, my first response would be is, well, are, are there too many names in the title or too few? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, that's a very good question. I mean, Ed, whenever one gets an, inv uh, an invitation to do, to do a paper, um, uh, one thinks, well, that's very kind to be invited to do it. Then one thinks, well, where am I going to get the time uh, to be able to go and do it? Can I really take this on? And, and then one thinks, well, uh, what would be the best way of um, expressing what one wants to express? And, and, and how can one come up with something which would communicate that most, uh, uh, most effectively? Um, and I think that what I wanted to do was to uh, pick up on a few of the German figures, which I would worked on in the past, um, such as Goethe, uh, such as Nietzsche, uh, but also then to try and stretch it uh, a little bit in, in different ways. Uh, and that is to say, to go, um, as it were, in a horizontal direction from the Goethe and Nietzsche tradition to other figures in German intellectual history, uh, and that's Schelling, um, because I think Schelling is probably insufficiently discussed. I mean, I know that he um, is written about by Zizek, and I know that there is a Schelling yeah. scholarship which is, which is active, but, but I think you'd probably agree that he's, he's, he's less spoken about uh, than, than Goethe and Nietzsche would be. So I wanted to stretch it in that direction and, and bring in another, uh, uh, a, another figure. Uh, and then I also wanted to try and take it a little bit um, uh, in a vertical direction and, and, and update it a little bit and bring it into the 20th century and talk about the Frankfurt School, talk about Adorno and Horkheimer, and then to push it way back into the past and take Plato as a kind of little bit of a starting point. But, but what I found, what I tried to show within the, the limitations of the space that I, that I had and, you know, that one often has a sense when writing a paper, it's, one's never going to have enough space, it could never be long enough, there's never going to be enough time to discuss these things uh, uh, fully. But what I wanted to show was that this theme of madness is absolutely central to all these figures, is that they, they, they have two things that they want to say. Um, uh, there, are different, there are different forms of madness, and they're not all good. And that point is made um, uh, by... Um, uh, by Plato, it's made by Schelling, uh, that there is a kind of pathological madness which, which, which doesn't get you anywhere at all. Um, the rational I suppose that, <laughs> I, I, Well, I, I suppose that's exemplified by the kind of madness that, that Nietzsche eventually succumbs to. This whole difficult question of what made Nietzsche go mad there's always the suggestion that it, you know, it's because he thought of the death of God, or because he thought of eternal recurrence, or he thought of Lufon Salome, or I don't know, whatever it is. But there's, it, it's, it's, it, it's nothing to do with that. It was, it's, um, the evidence is that it was a congenital um, a disease. It was something that he that inherited. Uh, but, but Nietzsche's madness, I think we could say, is an example of bad madness. It, it, it doesn't do you anyway. It, it leaves you, in, in the case of, uh, of Nietzsche, uh, for 10 years, um, absolutely the mercy of your sister, editing your papers, you can't do anything at all. So uh, it, there's an acknowledgement, and there's an acknowledgement with Schelling as well, where he talks about it uh, as a kind of unproductive madness. But uh, there's also the madness, which Plato talks about, which is, as he says, divine. 
uh, which is an expression of a communion with the divine. And, and there is that madness as well that, that Shelley talks about, where he says that it is essential for our creativity. Um, and this kind of positive madness, I suppose it's the kind of madness that Jung himself went through, if that's the right term, when he's producing uh, the Red Book. Uh, let's call it madness, we could call it a confrontation with the unconscious, but you need to go a little bit mad in order to be creative as well. And, and curiously enough, I think that that is also uh, one of the points that we can take out of the critique of modernity that we find in the Frankfurt School, uh, uh, which is that um, what we think to be normal, the Frankfurt School says, is in many ways deeply, deeply mad. It's irrational because it's all about control, not understanding, not, not sympathy, not um, communion, but it is deeply paranoid and is really based on control. Uh, and the, the incredible critique of technology that we find um, uh, with the Frankfurt School, not just with them, big bugbear as well uh, uh, for Heidegger, and, and what they're trying to say is, is that um, we, need to, we need to understand that what we think of as normal and rational and good and common sense and so on is in many ways deeply mad. And I think that that's the argument which I can take from Jung's Red Book as well, is that there he is going along very, very nicely, very, very comfortably, very successfully, um, and then it all falls apart and he has to then reconstruct it. And what's so fascinating for me about the Red Book is that it's a way of, of using art aesthetics, language, painting, in order to, to reconstruct the self um, and in order for Jung to haul himself out of this experience of confrontation with the, with the unconscious, out of this experience of madness, for want of a, for want of a better word, uh, and, and, and to reconstruct the self and to reconstruct, therefore, the project of analytical psychology as something which is new and fascinating, dynamic, and which then, you know, he's able to pursue in various ways uh, through alchemy, through Gnosticism, the various forms of, it, of symbolic system for the next um, 50 years. So it's, it's quite a project. So that's what I was trying to do in that short, in that short piece and, and, and problematize madness as something it's, which is um, uh, not to glorify it, not to be a sort of Antoine Artaud and say madness is good and let's just go out and let it all rip. Not that simple, not simply that Dionysian madness, but to say that there is a kind of madness of Apollo as well, a madness of Apolline rationality, which is too restrictive, uh, too controlling. Um, and and, and that's, uh, that's where I would see the kind of uh, ground for a union of opposites, if you like, between the opposites of Frankfurt School on the one hand and uh, Jung and analytical psychology. Is that, is that as a result of like the ego? You know, the rationality and the, the busy making. I mean, we need ego building capacities to function in society and to go to work and to be extroverts. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I think that's, a, that's an important point. Um, I, I suppose I want to bring into the discussion of the, uh, of the Frankfurt School a, a kind of related figure um, who seems to have fallen out of the picture a bit as well these days, and that is uh, Herbert Marcuse. Because uh, uh, I, I love Herbert Marcuse, I think one-dimensional man, okay, it's not a very politically correct title, but, you know, it doesn't matter, one-dimensional man, um, uh, even better, Eros and Civilization uh, are, are great analytic books, really, really worthwhile uh, they're looking at. Um, and, and, and they're very readable as, as well, which is perhaps more than one could say for, for, for Theodore Adorno, as well as a bit of struggle. Uh, but one of the points that, uh, that Marcuse makes is um, he takes on board Freud's point that, uh, that we need the ego. Because we've got to go out there and um, you know, get, uh, get food on the table and get houses built and um, construct and do things and, and have a project of civilization. Um, and then that involves ego construction and that it also involves renunciation as well. Of course, that's one of the points that Freud makes, isn't it? That, that one of the things the ego has to learn is to defer pleasure or renounce pleasure in some ways. And, and then there's that whole... And repress. And to repress, absolutely. Absolutely, that's right. Um, and, then, and then that's why Freud's view seems to be so incredibly gloomy, is that we, on the one hand, we've got to repress, uh, but on the other... 
the danger of repression is that it leads to some kind of outburst, this return of the repressed and neurosis and so on. And there we are, we're kind of caught in this double bind. Um, and I think we could agree that that's a fairly gloomy view of things. It might be the right view, but, but it's a fairly view, gloomy view. I wanted to interject on the Frankfurt School because something came across my Twitter, Twitter stream this morning, which I thought was very apt. And it's from uh, Martha Crawford, who is a union analyst in New York City. Uh, her Twitter uh, account is Shrink Thinks. And uh, she comments on another tweet, which she just says exactly this, amen. So the original tweet was, from Ashley Ford, and here's what she said. You are watching people go through withdrawal from the emotional addiction to the myth of certainty. Mm. Okay, no, that, that, uh, that I, I, I must follow up that, uh, that Twitter feed. What was it, Shrink Thinks? Is yeah, Shrink Thinks is, Mar is Martha Crawford is her name, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D. Okay. And, uh, and it was Ashley Ford who originally originated that tweet. But you are watching people go through the withdrawal from the emotional addiction to the myth of certainty. The idea that through, through Logos, we can someday perfect ourselves and everything will be hunky-dory. Yeah. We have okay. to be able to live in chaos is my point, I guess. But yeah, that, 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 that's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll follow that up. Uh, in, in, in a way, of course, I think that's, that's a part of the argument that, that Marcuse is making, uh, which is um, not to reject ego and, 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 and not to reject logos, uh, but to say, is there something <clears throat> problematic in which, in, in our understanding of logos, maybe it's, 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 it's divine qualities as well. Uh, is there something problematic in the ego? And, and this, this question that we were talking about with Sandy um, about renunciation and, and, and repression. Uh, because, because Marcuse tries to find a way out of the, um, out of the Freudian double bind uh, that we have to repress in order to have civilization. But if we, if we repress, uh, then there's the danger of returning and, and civilization uh, falls apart. Um, uh, because out with Eros comes uh, uh, repressed Thanatos as well. And Marcuse's answer is to say, well, uh, of course we have to defer pleasure and we have to have repression, renunciation of a kind. But he, he puts forward the view that in the modern world, what we've invented is surplus repression. So, and I think it's a fascinating idea and, and yes. really, very helpful for, really, really very helpful for understanding things which is that surplus repression means we, 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 we repress more than we, we have to. We don't just do the necessary egoistic kind of civilization constructing repression, uh, but we go beyond that. And in fact, I think we can say Marcuse is really arguing, and perhaps that's what makes him a thinker of post-modernity, is that we turn repression itself into a source of pleasure. We return yeah. repression itself into a source of pleasure, and we do the opposite as well, which is to say, we make pleasure itself a form of work. So we, uh, 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 Tim was saying, well, the only way that we can get any solid uh, is to go out and get drunk and so on. Um, uh, That's a Zizek but, but, joke too. But, I'm sorry, say it again. Zizek makes that joke too, like the super ego feels guilty for not having enough pleasure. Uh, a, 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 that's exactly right. I think I, and in some ways we can say that, you know, Zizek is maybe a bit like Marcuse on speed. Um, uh, that, 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 uh, but I, I prefer my Marcuse simply because it's clear <laughs> in, a, in a way that Zizek isn't, is, isn't always. Um, but, um, uh, but, but Marcuse, I think Marcuse is very helpful on, on this point because a part of that normality that we had, I mean, part of the things that we, we, we miss at the moment where we, we can't go out and, and, and um, see family and friends, go for social activities and, and, and so on. Uh, but I think Marcuse also draws our attention to the way that those activities themselves can become, uh, can become tyrannies or can, can become a kind of, of, of duty is that um, uh, we, we um, go out and party because we've got a party and we go out and spend our money because we've got to spend our money. Um, and as we, at the moment, 
this is one of the peculiar things about the, about the crisis is that we're told, well, you shouldn't go out and do economic activity. And that's maybe the one of the things that's really shocking people is because we're told all the time, well, you've got to spend and you've got to invest and you've got to consume. And of course, we can't do that at the moment. And it brings us up a bit, a, a bit short. And maybe it makes us think a little bit about, about the madness of consumption that's going on the rest of the time. And the, uh, as far as the Frankfurt School is concerned, the madness of mass entertainment, the madness of the culture industry, the madness which makes, makes fun itself a kind of, of duty. And I know that's something that Zizek really, really plays on as well. Say, so, Paul, did you mention Thanatos? I certainly did. Um, uh, just in just in passing, uh, just in passing, in relation to in relation to to, to Freud's argument um, about repression, uh, uh, because Freud wants to argue, well, um, uh, what do we repress um, when we uh, when we repress our instincts? Is on the one hand, there's the there's the deferment of gratification, so there is the um, deferral of, of of erotic and other and other pleasures, uh, but we also, as part of that control, defer expressions of aggression and negativity as well. Um, that is to say, it was say Thanatos, um, and that seems to me why for Freud it's so dangerous that we have repression is because on the one hand we need it uh, for the profit of civilization. But, but on the other, there's always that danger, as as the in this hydraulic model, uh, as 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 eros builds up, is that Thanatos is driving up as as well, and that's why when the system finally falls apart, it's not just an erotic outpouring, but it is a dangerously erotic. It is a violently erotic outpouring. It is either a violent form of eros or an erotic form of violence. Either way, Freud sees that as something which is thoroughly inimical. Uh, to 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 salve, uh, to to the project of of social construction. Um, I, uh, go ahead, I, Tim. Thanatos, um, kind of a wiggly term, but the way I've come to to look at it is um, is like a, a a partner to eros in that. I think of a relationship between two people as being a, an archway where one person, um, where both people are, are dependent on each other, unlike something like, like think of an image of a bridge. So unlike a, an image of like Tower Bridge in London, which is two towers with a little platform that runs mm -hmm. in between, on the arch bridge, both parties are are totally um, engaged with each other in such a way that there's a strength in the shape of the relationship that that strengthens both parties. Hmm. And so I think of eros being the the gravity that is is applied to the second person, and Thanatos is the kind of resistance that that second person provides that helps hold us up. Mm. And so it's not so much a negative kind of a death wish like, uh, like Freud talked about it, but a kind of positive aspect of, of the erotic intention to engage the world in a, mm. in a, in a really dramatic way. Mm. Uh, no, you're certainly right that uh, that, that Freud puts uh, uh, puts a negative spin on uh, on, on on Thanatos. But of course, I, I mean, uh, look at the time in which Freud is writing. So you know, in, in the run up to the to the outbreak of war, in the aftermath of the First World War, and in the run up to the Second World War, it, it, it's not surprising that he's he, he's looking to explain those those negative aspects of civilization as well. Um, but I think you're quite right that one can, one can, as it were, de-dramatize Thanatos and see it in terms of, um, well, a, 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 how should we say, that we have centrifugal and centripetal forces. Maybe that's a kind of Gerson way of talking about it. So that would, be, that would fit in your idea of, of, of a bridge as being something stable, a stable construct which arises through, through equal and opposing forces. Uh, you have gravity pulling down, but you also have the force of the, uh, of the connections uh, against each other, um, and 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 I think that's uh, th that's after all the way that Freud initially wants us to think about eros, 
as there is a tendency for life to, to, to procreate, there is a tendency for things to join together, so positive in that sense, but that there is also an, an, an urge, a drive in the other direction for things to move apart, for things to, uh, things to fall apart, for things to dissolve, and, and that's what he calls the death drive, that we call Thanatos as, as, as well. Um, and, and, and what's interesting is that, is that Freud, this great rational kind of figure, as he thinks of himself, is actually having recourse to these mythic notions in order to formulate his ideas as well. Makes, makes Freud, as I've often thought, much, much closer to Jung than perhaps the both of them would have wanted to admit. <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, Paul, I want to talk about a bit about the duality between Logos and Eros. And yeah. I've, I've taken a, a different sort of approach to it. I'd just like to hear your comment on it. So my uh, approach is to say that we need Logos 100% because everything in the room around you, including the screen and what you're seeing all of our faces, is the result of perfect Logos. In other words, you can't have a computer, but you can't have a book or a picture on your wall or your eyeglasses without uh, Logos having uh, perfected and designed all of those products that we have. Um, but, um, and when the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, I often shock people by holding up my Bible and saying this is just a black doorstop unless you put life into it. And so the way I'm, I've been seeing it is that Logos is a structure, um, whether it be in, in, because Logos also means word, of course. And yeah. so Logos is a structure that helps us think and let, helps us build things, but it's all dead. There's nothing alive in it. And a Bible isn't anything but a book, but a doorstop until uh, a pastor or a human being puts life into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what Eros is. And I've been sort of pulled that way by uh, Francoise O'Kane, who wrote this book called Sacred Chaos uh, many years ago. It was published by uh, Inner City Books. Uh, it's out of print now, unfortunately, but... Um, but we have electronic copies of it around. And um, uh, so I wonder if you'd comment on that perspective on duality, on that yeah. duality, since there are millions of dualities. But the, to me, this is sort, sort of almost the most base duality that we have. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no, interesting question, Skip. It, it, it's certainly an important duality as, as far as Jung's Red Book is concerned, isn't it? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and he um, uh, he both explicitly talks about the relationship between uh, logos and eros, as well as um, as well as allegorically, in form of the figures of, of Salome uh, and 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 Philemon and and so on. Uh, so so I, I think that that's absolutely central to Jung's thought as uh, as well. Um, and, and I suppose I'd see that in this way um, Jung's articulating a viewpoint which is. Uh, in many ways, uh, deeply platonic as well, uh, which is that uh, if Logos is about understanding, and you're certainly right that it uh, it underpins technical understanding, um, but nevertheless, it ought not to be uh, uh, reducible to. Um, uh, and that Eros is in many ways uh, essential if we're to have the kind of understanding in which, uh, of, of the kind in which, in which Plato, in which Goethe, in which Nietzsche and which Jung are interested, which is to say um, uh, that if you if you want to understand something, in a way you really have to love it as well. Um, and, and, and it's the kind of advice that I'd give to any student when they're saying, well, you know, which subject should I do, or which book should I read, which course should I take, uh, what dissertation topic should I do, is that I always think they should do whatever it is that they are really, really interested in, uh, and, and that they should study something because they love it. Um, it, it. If they go in and they embark on a course of study and their heart isn't really in it, they're not going to do as well. And if they do do very well, it's going to be an immense personal cost for them. And I think that cost would be too high. Um, and, and I think that this idea of understanding 
um, something in the terms of, of logos, we might say that, that um, a, a logos without eros is a kind of um, a, a kind of poorer understanding. Is a is a kind of um, uh, a low level understanding, a kind of a, a kind of uh, a um, It's something which is which is which is a, a purely rational. But if we have eros and logos together, we're therefore we're coming much closer to something that we could call phenunft. It is something which is which is um, uh, which understands um, the object, the subject, in its own right. Which has respect for it, um, and which is therefore open to being changed by it as well. And I think that's is, is that not with that we do agree, Skip, that that is that that is the kind of relation between them that analytical psychology is trying to is trying to promote. Um, it's not anti-rational, um, uh, but it's saying that there has to be that there's a danger that rationality becomes, in the lang in the language that Frankfurt School uses, simply instrumental rationality. And I can yes. see Sandy, you wanting to contribute as well. Yeah. Well, uh, are you familiar with uh, the work of Jacques Lacan? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, as, as we speak about logos and, you know, words and language and linguistics and also madness, yeah. uh, and, and I mean, if you listen to a madman, you know, his, he's got the word salad. It's the psychotic language that yeah. we can't understand. Yeah. Um, because we can't understand the signifying chain. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, the work between the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, all combining yeah. into what does this word mean? You know, yeah. if you could speak on that, and that would tie it to uh, yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. That, 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 that's interesting. Um, I, I always have to make a caveat uh, when, when saying something about Lacan is because I'm, I'm never really quite sure that I've understood him properly myself. Um, and, and, and maybe that makes it difficult for me to love Lacan in the way that I in the way that I ought to. But I but I keep going back to him and and, and have another go. Um, and, and and just to pick up on you make you you make the point about the the way that, that Lacan separates out the different uh, the, the different realms of the the symbolic, the real, um, and 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 that of and that of the signifier as as, as well. It, it, which is my question would be, and perhaps you could help me with this, Sandy, is where does the body fit into Lacan's vision of the human being? And how does the body act as anything other than a site for potential um, um, uh, neurosis or, 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 or symptomatic um, problem? Uh, well, wouldn't that be object petit a, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the little a, the, the mm. real, the elements mm. of the real is mm. coming from the body. Mm. But we can never know that. But 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 do we ever know what object putty art is? Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. It's, I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it, I mean, I'm fascinated by Lacan, but I've never really got my head around it, and 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 I can't begin to imagine what it must be like in a therapeutic uh, setting. But that's maybe that's maybe that's maybe another. another you, you should work with autistic children, and eventually you'll get it. <laughs> Okay, well, that that um, uh, th that that would be a fascinating insight into in, into seeing how something like that could uh, uh, could work. Um, the reason why I bring up this point is because it seems to me that that Lacan approaches the human being as something which is uh, fundamentally uh, linguistic. Um, but what I what I what I can't understand is how how his psychology would help us understand the relationship between, if you want, soul and body. Um, and what happens to the haptic element? What happens to the sensory element, uh, which it seems to me is so important for for a thinker like uh, like Jung, uh, not just in some trivial and anecdotal way of Jung of Jung as a sign of, as a kind of bon viveur and so on, but 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 that Jung is very interested in the uh, in the body. Um, I'm thinking about his, his fascinating comments that he makes in his seminar on Nietzsche's Zarathustra, where he says, why is Nietzsche important to it? It's because Nietzsche reinserts the body. Nietzsche reinsists on the value and the importance of the, of the body. And, and it seems to me that, that that brings us into this question of, of uh, the erotic dimension of the body as well, it, which is so central to uh, what's happening in the, in the unfolding dynamic of the red, of the red book. Um, so that's not to dismiss Lacan, 
But, but to say, it seems to me that there's something partial in the way that, that Lacan approaches his triad of, of imaginary, symbolic, and real, um, and, 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 that, and that Jung's approach seems to me more integrative, more holistic, and to offer a framework which would understand how Logos and Eros um, are co-implicates of each other, are not identical, this is not to reduce them, um, but, uh, but the, the best form of Logos is based on a form of Eros as well, and that's of course why. Uh, the figure of Eros is, is seen in Plato's Symposium as having this important role of conducting us to understanding. It's true that in Plato, Logos ends up being superior to Eros, but they're still there in the game together. And it seems to me that that's one of the things in which, in which psychology, psychoanalysis is, is important, is in reactivating these approaches to, to old concepts, ancient concepts of Logos and Eros, or indeed ancient myths of Thanatos and Eros as well. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd just like to add that um, you asked about, isn't that where Jungian psychology is? And Edinger commented that, that what Jung really did was talk about uh, link knowledge and experience. So, so, um, so what he's saying is it's linked knowledge, okay? you know, or linked experience, experience linked to knowledge. Um, and so you actually have to have the experience. I mean, it, it also comes back to this idea that Robert Heinlein came up with in his novel, uh, Strangers in a Strange Land, I believe, where, uh, which is the idea of grok. You have to, it's more than understanding. You, just understanding is not enough. You have to grok it. And uh, that's G R O K. By the way, you can look it up on the internet, and there's a there's a three page long definition of the term grok. But once you read what Heinlein said about what grok means, then you appreciate what what is being driven at by Jung, which is something that you have to experience in order uh, to understand a definition. I mean, a definition is all well and good and it's all logos, but unless you've internalized it and made it part of your life, then it's nothing. Yeah. yeah. But, but would you agree therefore, uh, Skip, that, that um, the function of the Red Book is to, is to um, uh, open up to uh, those who read it and those who gape with it a kind of a kind of experience um, analogous to what Jung went through. Uh, I suppose Jung's experiences must be, you know, in, ineffable in some sense. You know, they're unrepeatable. Yeah. They were they were his. They can't be shared by anybody else. But right. by working through in the form of the Red Book, he gives us a a a, a kind of an exteriorized version. I'm thinking of that wonderful passage. Um, uh, which is quoted by Sonu Shambhasani in, in his introduction, when Jung is talking to one of his clients, I think it's Christian Morgan, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. And he says, well, what you have to do is to have your own red book. Uh, what you have to do is to build a cathedral, um, a, a cathedral for your soul. And, right. and so he's, again, he's inserting what he's doing into a religious tradition, an architectural tradition, um, that the cathedral is on the one hand objective, it, it, it's there, there it, there it stands, and everybody can go into it and, and visit it. But it all depends on the spirit in which you enter into the cathedral. And similarly, it all depends on the spirit, the frame of mind, the logos, uh, maybe the eros that one brings to the Red Book too in interpreting it. Would that be well, fair enough? I, I, it, as far as it goes, I mean, um, I had uh, a confrontation with the unconscious in 1993, so 16 years before the Red Book emerged. And it lasted for eight months, and it emerged as a novel. Um, and it was a novel that wrote itself. In other words, I have no recollection of actually uh, writing it, but I know that I did, okay? And I actually lived in that space where, um, where the novel was written. And I call it the autobiography of my anima, but um, some aspects of it came out that were phonic and pornographic. Um, and uh, I was in the middle of a business career that I didn't 
want to just bring that to the public. So I put it in my drawer for 21 years. I finally published it only in Kindle form on uh, Amazon uh, in 2014. I promised myself when I was 70, I would publish it. <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> but uh, nobody's written it or read it except for Deborah Stevens, who's a member of this group. But, um, but I, um, what the Red Book did for me was mm. because I, I had no psychological training in it whatsoever. I ne never took a psychology course. I was totally logos. I was, a, I'm a lawyer, MBA, and I've been in a business career. And so, um, you know, I really didn't know what happened to me. And mm. by reading the Red Book, I said, wow, if that could happen to the greatest psychologist of the 20th century, uh, then maybe I'm not so crazy. And mm -hmm. it gave me that encouragement and, yeah. and you know, pushed me along uh, toward uh, more, uh, more study of Jung and, and yeah. the people who write about Jung. But, mm -hmm. uh, and, but I had, no, you know, I didn't have a psychiatrist helping me through that time. I, I, I just thought I was writing a novel, but, yeah. Yeah. but when I read the red book, then I said, Oh, okay. That's what happened to me too. Okay. Right. I, I mean, not with the same characters, obviously this was my yeah. own, but, um, and you know, in, in many ways I've been saying for years and now I can say, emphatically that it was the autobiography of my anima right. uh, um, during a certain period of time. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll just interject and share a little bit about how uh, reading the article uh, by uh, Dr. Bishop has impacted me um, <clears throat> about madness um, and, and connecting everything that has already been said, at least from my perspective. So um, I curiously, I was just watching last night and this morning, these young men who jump off of mountains and other structures with these wingsuits. And I'm thinking of how in your essay, uh, Dr. Bishop, you talk about, you mentioned Young's commenting that love is also dangerous. Mm. And, and these young men, um, uh, there's there's like a lot of videos on YouTube tributes to this fellow or that fellow, and there's occasionally some women apparently that do this crazy sport too. Mm. Um, so the, their love ends up killing them because they keep pushing the limits, getting closer and closer to the rock faces and going through little targets or even holes in rocks. It's just insanity. Um, so anyway, I, I've... I've been, as I've just turned 60, and I'm thinking, you know, this is, I'm into the home stretch. It's time to, um, as your article says, for me to put on a wingsuit as well. And, and madness is really a, from a perspective, correct? If, I, if I'm an affront to someone's a story of reality or myth of reality, if I'm an affront to their held perception, they'll think I'm a madman. Mm. And, and you mention in the conclusion of your essay, 9-11, the terrorist attack in New York, which indeed it was. Uh, however, the evidence uh, and a little background, I have a, a bachelor's of science degree in civil engineering. Uh, I'm not a graduate uh, student, uh, but uh, and I didn't specialize in structural engineering. However, uh, there's a committee of some 3,000 architects and engineers. There's uh, firefighters. There's lawyers. And in fact, there's a lawyers committee for 9-11 Truth. And the evidence is that those buildings were a controlled demolition. So right now, I'm being an affront to a lot of people's perceptions of reality. And I would propose my proposition is that, that our virus that we have today of this COVID coronavirus is um, actually very mild compared to what 
we were talking about earlier with Dr. Woods, Woodcock, uh, Dr. John Woodcock, someone, I think it was his term, uh, that there's a psychic virus that is of a greater concern of any zoonotic virus that we're contending with. So um, in summary, the, uh, the consequences of what I've just stated, that that uh, these structures on 9-11 came down as a controlled demolition, that there's a lot more that needs to be investigated and revealed. And there is a committee working with the Southern District of New York State Attorney trying to move forward with the grand jury in initiative. And they're, they're, they're being stymied. Um, the consequences of, of this 9-11 uh, not being properly investigated is a lot more serious than this relatively mild uh, pandemic <laughs> because the number of people, and, and it's not just an American problem because NATO, I'm in Canada, NATO, you're in England, also were participants in, in this uh, supposed redress of this mm. ter terrorist attack. So anyway, I'm just putting that out there because to me it's an illustration of you know me being a madman, even saying something that could potentially get me killed, but confronting the myth. So um, I'm not sure if you've given that any thought or if anybody in your realm is studying this, what I just said, because it does have a tremendous connection with everything that's been said. Yeah. Uh, 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 th thank, th thanks for that comment. Um, uh, you're certainly resisting the myth of certainty. It would be fair to say, I think, drawing on the uh, drawing on the concept that uh, uh, had been had been quoted earlier on. Um, and I think, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll leave, leave the nine eleven to one side because, um, uh, although I'm I'm always uh, fascinated by. Uh, by, by conspiracy theories, I, I haven't looked into the uh, in, in, into the question of, um, of what happened what happened at the twin towers in in, in particular detail. Um, and, um, and I think, like anything that's historical, um, on the one hand, um, how can one ever be sure of what uh, of what happened on any occasion? Uh, on the other, um, there must be a preponderance of evidence that would point in in one direction rather than another. Um, and that preponderance of evidence can can shift, can be added to, can be can be revised as new as new evidence comes to uh, comes to light. Um, but it seems to me that that's what a sophisticated understanding of history would be: is that is that vs eigentlich gewesen ist that the German says you know, what actually happened. Um, it, well, you cannot, you can't go back and, and be certain. But th there is the whole point of history is that you have a methodology and that you have an approach and that you have a you have a logos. You have a scientific approach. You have you have a, a logical approach, which enables you to go back and find well. There's a preponderance of evidence for this, a preponderance of evidence for uh, for that. Um, um, uh, well, can I interject for a second? Yes, please do. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I'm I'm again trying to bring this back to like madness and uh, and even Jung's idea of it, where you know, if if a, if a patient thought that last night they were really on the moon and you're trying to convince them that they're psychotic and they were not and that's not reality uh you know at some point even jung realized that ah that person was on the moon you know uh, in in their imagination and that's real in its own way so when it comes to these conspiracy theories and you know whether it was a terrorist attack that was an inside job or not um you know, it, it could have been both. And it, it, it's in, the, in, this, in the, this virus, this psychic virus is, in fact, the fact that our whole collective imagination is contributing to various ideas that are real enough to alter our future. Okay. No. No. Th th thanks very much for that, Sandy. I, I think what I what I'd want to do is to sort of um, flip that flip flip that on its head, and and say um, that, uh, that there are clearly instances either of someone someone who thinks they've they've been on the moon, whatever, or uh, or, or something that's happening in the UK. I don't know if it's if it's uh, happening in in other countries too, uh, which is people attacking five G masts. 
uh, because of claims that have been put out that they are um, uh, uh, connected with the virus. Uh, and so I think in, in the United Kingdom, about 59 uh, 5G masts uh, have, been, have been destroyed, have been attacked uh, because of uh, rumors that are out there on, on, on social media. Um, so I think we need to distance ourselves from that and, and say, well, th there are things which are, which are mad. Um, and, and Jung's pretty plain about that, and Shannon's pretty plain about that. But, but the, the real virus of madness is to be located in what we call the normal. And I think that's the point that the Frankfurt School makes, and it seems to me that that's the point that Jung is making as, as, as well. Um, it, it's certainly there in the, the comment which I um, uh, took from a discussion of the Red Book on, on Radio 4 with, uh, with Andrew Samuels. Um, which I uh, tucked in right at the end of the essay, because I thought that what Andrew Samuels was saying then um, uh, was absolutely right. And, and Andrew Samuels makes the comment about the Red Book. He says it's not just an archival document. He recognizes it's archival, but it's not just that. It's not just an archival document. It's a, a very contemporary document. It says a lot about what's wrong with modern society. It's about why living in the kind of society we've got right now drives you crazy. Because the inner world, what you've got going on inside you, is not listened to, not wanted on board. We live in a flattened, regulated, controlled society that's also actually out of control, as the economic crisis shows. Well, that, that contextualizes historically the, the remark, but, but the, the branking crisis, uh, um, at the time of which when Andrew Samuels made this comment, uh, in the health crisis, the global pandemic that we have at the, at the moment, uh, that seems to me is to make the point that things are out of control, but, but, but the Red Book is recognizing that if we understand that we're out of control, that's the, first, that's the first step towards getting back in control again, but a more nuanced, a more sensitive, a more um, uh, uh, uncontrolling kind of control where we are seeking to live in a cosmos, a world which has meaning rather than a world which is devoid of meaning because we're just out uh, to exploit it as far as uh, and as much as we can. Okay, I'd just like to um, offer a little counterpoint to uh, what Miles is talking about and uh, also just talk about the fact that Edinger definitely talked about psychic epidemics and talked about, for example, Nazism in Germany as a psychic epidemic. And it's quite evident that we have a psychic epidemic coming along with coronavirus. So I'd really like you to um, I really like you to address that, but um, just in turn, in as a counterpoint to what Miles was saying, um, I heard a report that the way the World Trade Center was constructed, basically, was that they basically put four big bolts on each corner of the, you know, they created they created a platform. And the platform was connected to the curtain wall that, that created the out exterior of the, of the World Trade Center just with four big bolts on each corner, <laughs> okay? And, and that when the thing started to come down, it would have looked like a controlled explosion, but what happened was because, um, you know, it hit high enough, these planes hit high enough up, they started to come down and this structure wasn't that strong and it basically just opened the two trade center buildings as a, like a, a can opener. And it looked at, you know, so it can look like a controlled explosion, which does that, it simply drops it. But the reason it was dropped was only because of the way it was built, which nobody ever imagined that would happen. I mean, it was strong enough to hold it together for 25 years or whatever, but nobody ever imagined that an airplane would fly through and start a huge fire that would melt the bolts and the, and the whole floors would start to come down on one another, one after another. Uh, so actually, I mean, Skip, it's it's Building Seven that we begin with, which is a forty-seven story office tower that went down at seventeen twenty in the afternoon on that day, mm -hmm. and um, 
And so you begin with that structure, a 47-story building that fell at free fall speed in the late afternoon. Um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology report claiming that ordinary office fires did that. So anyway, all I'm saying is I'm not actually starting with the Twin Towers. I'm starting with Building 7 for the these um, the, the, the grand jury petition of 57, over 50 articles of evidence is focused in beginning with building seven. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't want to get into a debate about, about structural integrity. I only wanted to offer a counterpoint to what Miles had said before. But the, the real topic for discussion is the fact that what I see is that we're on the cusp of a psychic epidemic, which is global in nature and involving our entire species. And I'm wondering what you may see as antidotes to that. That's a question for I, Paul. I have a, I, I have a question that just associated with the same question. Can I add a little bit in it? Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so 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 the psychic epidemic which we are we are talking about, and at the same uh, 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 element of madness which I see, I see in unfolding right now. For an example, what happened in Canada yesterday, and um, uh, uh, in India, things like that have been happening. For an example, imagine like thousands of people deciding to walk for like 15, 20 days with like really young children and with a banana and a plastic bottle in hand. It is madness. It is simple madness <laughs> in human. Uh, but a lot of people collectively took their decision. Yes, right? to them it was very um, rational. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, uh, rash, rational when a lot of things, like, like, like a life is at a risk because a like, lot of people died in, this, in, in the process and everybody knew about it. So uh, They need to move to action. Yeah, so so basically, th th this is this is where I, I was I was adding adding it to uh, a Skip Sir's question um, uh, to ask about like what what do we see unfolding because this ha we didn't hear the end of what you were saying, Kushbu. Could you say it again? <clears throat> Okay. Uh, what, what Kushba is referring to, uh, just for clarity, is that uh, tw it's literally 25 million people uh, who, are, who are day laborers and living on a day-to-day -day basis in India. When the government shut India down a couple weeks back, they simply got up and started to head home. And so it's the, it's the largest mass migration in India since partition, since the, the Muslims started to go to Pakistan and the, the Muslim and the uh, Hindus came back into lower India uh, during partition. And uh, <coughs> it's, it's at least 25 million people that are involved in that. So that's part of the psychic epidemic that's coming on. So, Oh, me, uh, Kushbu can watch and, and uh, we don't have to wait for her to come back because she can watch this in replay, but... Um, she is back. Oh, she is back. Okay, yeah. terrific. She, okay. You unmute her. Oh, hi, uh, Kushbu. So we didn't hear the end of what you were saying. Yeah, I think you, you summed it up uh, very nicely. Yeah. Okay, that, that's great. Um, uh, uh, thanks very much to 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 Kishbu and to and to Skip for the for that for that that jointly posed uh, that question there. Um, uh, uh, 
try and return to the argument I was trying to make at the beginning, which is, um, is, the, is, is the psychic epidemic uh, that we're currently experiencing along with the, um, the, the viral epidemic, uh, is it anything qualitatively new? Uh, or, or is it an extension of something that was there um, uh, already? In other words, um, is, there, is there something uh, about, is this a new madness that we're experiencing, uh, uh, or is it an old form which is manifesting itself, or which is bringing out a madness which was, which was latent within the system uh, anyway? Um, and I think it's a debate that one can have about this whole question of periodization of, of history and the relationship of modernity to, to postmodernity, um, uh, which is to say, well, you know, is, is there really a qualitative shift that takes place as one moves from one epoch to, uh, to another? Or is there really an underlying continuity? It, is it really that there are um, uh, uh, underlying problems, uh, underlying uh, issues, crises, which are simply becoming more manifest? Um, uh, through the form of uh, the global lockdown and through the form of um, uh, and actions that are taken to to combat the uh, the, the coronavirus, and, and and I suppose um, thinking about it from a Jungian point of view, uh, Jung seems to be a thinker who uh, is emphasising uh, uh, continuity. Uh, that, that seems to be that his that that is absolutely core to his approach, which is to say, well, you've got somebody in the the twentieth century as far as his client base was concerned, or in the 21st century, a collectivity in the 21st century who are uh, facing a particular situation. Um, for them, it is the modern. For them, it is the new. For them, it is the present. But Jung's point, it always seems to me, is to say, well, uh, what is there that is archetypal about it? And what does he mean by archetypal? Such a complicated term. And, and again, in his Nietzsche ser uh, seminars, uh, 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 Jung makes the point where he says, well, an archetype is simply a situation that keeps recurring. Uh, but it is, it is one which, through its uh, uh, recurrence, defines us. And he gives example of, I think it's the crocodile-infested river and, and so on. And then he then uh, looks at it in terms not just of situations, but of the relationships that we have in those situations that it concretizes in the form of people, so in the form of anima, in the form of wise old man, and so on. But, but the key to me, seems to me to understanding uh, what Jung means by the archetype is to see that it refers to an archetypal situation. And so therefore, is the situation that we're experiencing at the moment, is it something which is new? Well, it is, but it is also a recurrence of the old. Uh, and therefore, I suppose I would, I would want to use Jung to go back and look at uh, previous examples of, of epidemics, pre uh, previous examples where the basis of civilization has been, has been challenged by uh, something which is essentially biological, um, and I find it interesting that uh, certainly uh, in, in Britain, the political discourse has almost been to, to uh, personify the virus, to talk about it as a fight, to talk about it as the, as the enemy, and, and in particular to use a rhetoric which has been associated with uh, the British stance in the Second, in the Second World War. Uh, but we could simply see that we are dealing with an age-old conflict between nature on the one hand and culture on the other, between biology and human civilization, which is based on that biology and yet which seeks to transcend it. And that we're in a, this is a new for us, but that it is in terms of the history of humanity, something that we were currently faced, this battle between, between nature and culture, the dependence of culture on nature, and yet the fact that culture wants to transcend the natural. So, so would that so would that relate back to what you said about the Freudian repression and what happens as it comes out as aggression and violence as to what's going on as opposed to the archetypal basis? Well, um, it 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 would re it would relate to it in as in as much as one could argue that the present crisis is 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 showing uh, bringing to the fore tendencies that have been there in play for a number of years, a certain, certain, certain number of, of, of decades. Um, uh, one could look at that in the sphere of economics, so that it's, it's showing that whilst on the one hand there are benefits uh, to having a global economy for some people, uh, there are also risks that are associated with it um, as, as, as well. Um, 
and and that if we if we um, go down a particular route, we should always be aware of the danger of that route. In fact, turning around back around and taking us in, and taking us in another direction again. I think the dog's wanting to contribute as well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Kushbu lives with eight dogs, so. Uh, <laughs> oh well, that, we should we, we should we, we should we should listen to the animal within, and right. uh, and and maybe there's a source of wisdom there. He's trying to tell us something. Right, and somebody did observe that that every time that every time something is coming from the unconscious of Kushbu, the dogs bark. Every time she wants to speak, the dogs are there. <laughs> but um okay so i mean i i understand about dr young living in switzerland between the you know and through the wars and the great depression and all that um but i was always for a long while and i'm i'm less so now i've i've moderated my position but i was always troubled by the fact that he didn't try to do more actively and you know i'm a retired u.s marine so i'm <laughs> i'm into action right um why he didn't do something more actively in terms of trying to overcome what was happening in germany especially during the rise of hitler and so on and uh, others have been critical of it too to the point of even calling him anti-Semitic, which I think is a false charge, um, but, um, and evidenced by plenty of things, but, um, but, you know, do you think, I, I mean, obviously he stepped back and realized that he could do nothing, I think, is, mm, yeah. is, yeah. is what he did. And so he decided to be a doctor, which he did. And, um, and he continued to bring forth this prodigious, prodigious amount of scholarship that nobody can compare to really. It's very, yeah. very difficult. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I'd like to ask your opinion about whether you think there's any role for either Jungian analysts or psychologists, psychiatrists in general in trying to help ameliorate the consequences of what is going to be happening because we're only seeing the beginnings of it, but it's not very pretty in the United States right now. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, sure. Uh, uh, I mean, I think you're right. The whole the, the whole question of um, of, of what Jung uh, did, uh, and more importantly, what he didn't do in in the 30s and 40s, um, has 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 very much bedeviled his 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 public reputation, uh, and is still a a, a great source of uh, misunderstanding. I think uh, wide about him, as as well as debate within the uh, uh, within the analytic uh, community. Um, uh, and it's uh, and it's an example where I, um, I mean, Jung's not the only German thinker by any means, where one uh, 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 looks at statements that are that are made and can immediately see what the problems are. Uh, not just from our own perspective. Now, it's not about uh, laying a politically correct template onto uh, somebody's discourse from from say half a century or, or more than a century or, or, or a century ago, uh, but, but that is problematic in its own terms in the discourse of the at the time. Uh, and, and the whole idea of, of of a racial unconscious is is clearly something that's very problematic. And, and that's not to defend Jung. It's simply to say he's working within categories of the of, of the time. Is it is it core to his message? Um, I don't see that it is, and I think that we can very usefully talk about a collective unconscious without having to look at it in terms of genetics or without having to look at it in terms of uh, of race. So that's that's not to um, to exculpate Jung. It's simply to say we've got an intellectual tool here. Uh, can we use it for uh, our own purposes these days? And and it seems to me that we uh, that we can. Um, uh, what is the contribution of psychoanalysis to be to the, the current situation that we're in? I suppose there might be an argument or a question that one could ask of anybody that's engaged within the, uh, the arts and, and humanities. Um, on one level, I suppose it is uh, perhaps rather soberingly 
uh, very little uh, or nothing. Um, uh, what we need is um, a, a way of controlling the virus. What we need is a vaccine. Um, and, and that's going to be the first step. Um, can, I, can I interject and, and, for one and, second? Uh, yes, of course you may, Sandy. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I've been, um, I'm part of the American Psychoanalytics, so I've, we, there have been some Zoom meetings with, and town hall meetings with various institutes and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, folks from all over America. And, uh, and I've also done the same with the Jungian analysts. And I've noticed that the Freudian analysts are having a much harder time with the pandemic. I mean, they are writing their wills up and they're, they're just, they're, they're feeling fatigued. They're feeling guilty for not managing their patients like they like to have. They, they don't have that containing experience, that, you know, structure that they were always so used to, that frame that they're so used to. But I've noticed that the Jungian analysts are like, they're really using it as a creative way of, you know, being anchored and, and going, you know, further into their work. Just amazing how just looking at analysts oh. themselves, are the, the Freudian, neo-Freudians are having a much harder time with themselves. But, but, well, that's an interesting observation, Sandy, and, and perhaps it goes back to the conversation, the part of the conversation we're having earlier, where we said that Freud, Freud gets himself in a double bind about Eros and Thanatos and, and sees that their relation is fundamentally con conflictual and you can't de-repress because out with Eros then will come Thanatos as well. And, and, and it's, it's Marcuse who has to come in and kind of suggest, well, there is a way by having a notion of surplus repression, which helps understand uh, um, how that relationship can be, can be more successfully uh, uh, resolved. Um, uh, the point that I was trying to make was that uh, if, on the one hand, uh, the contribution of arts and humanities, the contribution of psychoanalysis to the current situation is, is very limited or, uh, in, in fact, um, uh, zero, because we're not involved with producing a vaccine, which is going to be, um, uh, it seems to be the only real way uh, that we get a handle on this situation. Um, but on, the, uh, on the other hand, it's an absolutely crucial thing, is that we work through, as a collectivity, as a society, as a... Uh, um, and as a planet, uh, what what we've gone through in our experiences, and certainly as far as, the, as, as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, um, uh, there are uh, reports of shortages uh, of PPE, of um, the correct protective gear for nurses working in the National Health Service, um, and all the trauma that they would have gone through of, um, ex of, of having caught the virus in cells, of having seen colleagues um, catching and dying of the virus, there will be an immense amount of trauma and an immense amount of grief. And I suspect there will probably be a lot of anger on the political level. So that, now if that isn't a field where psychoanalysts are needed to help us deal with that grief and that trauma and that anger, then I don't know what is. So it seems to me on the one hand very little, on the other hand a huge amount of work in, in, in responding to uh, the situation and helping us, under, and helping us un understand it. And it's, it's interesting in that respect to see a colleague was saying to me that, you know, in the arts and humanities, uh, so many of the presuppositions that they had for their research have just all of a sudden overnight uh, uh, disappeared. Um, and I think, that, I think that's right, that a lot of things that we've taken for granted about what arts and humanities are doing, by extension, psychoanalysis as, as, as well, we're going to want to revise and revisit and say, well, look, we've got a whole new set of questions to, to deal with. Um, and I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact, Sandra, that you're saying that the Jungian community is, um, as always, being, being creative and open to creativity in response to this, because there will be a lot of therapeutic work to be done, it seems to me. Yeah, you mentioned good. the uh, importance of the body uh, and that it can be left out by certain uh, people. And I wonder if you could say more about the importance of including the body. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, th th thanks for that, Nancy. I, I, I suppose that I would see the way that the body comes uh, comes into Jungian thought is 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 through um, uh, using the Red Book as an example uh, through its, its its artistic and 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 aesthetic sides. Um, and it's one of the things that that's often intrigued me about the way that Jung talked about the Red Book is that in um, Memory Machines Reflections, he's very very keen to say that the Red Book uh, is not a work of art. Uh, but, but yet when I look at it, 
um, or, or I look at the reproduction of it. Um, uh, it's there, it has this cartographic text, uh, it has these extraordinary pictures, uh, it has these uh, wonderful mandalas, um, it is written in a very, very rhythmic prose with lots of echoes of Nietzsche and Goethe there. It seems to me that this is a work of art. Um, and if it looks like a work of art and functions like a work of art, well, well, then that's what it is. And that's the level where it seems to me that Jung is, is reinserting the body. I think he has a strategic reason for not wanting to call the Red Book a work of art, which is what he's wanting to defend it against is the accusation that it is just a work of art, is that he's wanting to defend himself against a very um, a, a, a reductive approach um, maybe he's wanting to defend himself against people like me, uh, very scholarly and, um, uh, how shall I say, um, uh, a, a, a reproach he wants to, to uh, which runs the risk of losing that sense of, of radical adventure uh, that, that's in it, uh, simply wants to write books and articles about it rather than engaging with the actual material that's there. This material which he described as, as being like Ignatius volcanic lava. So um, it, it, in that sense, it's, it's not a work of art, it's lava, it's nature. But then on the other hand, it's not just the lava which has flown out of this volcano, which was young, but it's also lava which is, has which is worked at, which is petrified, uh, which has taken on the form of a stone and which Jung has sculpted. And I think about the way that Jung emphasizes that the Red Book is a product that emerges from the work on the Black Books. When we get the Black Books out and published, then maybe we'll see uh, what he means, but that it is something which is processual, something that is, that is worked at. It's nature, but it is nature which has been cultivated and encultured as, as well. And it seems to me that's why it's such a beautiful work, um, and again, an aesthetic work because it's, it's beautiful is because it has both this natural and this cultural element as, as well. And that's what seems to be central to Jung's project of, of analytical psychology is that it does not deny nature and it does not deny the body and it does not deny irrationality, but rather it seeks to work with it, to understand it, and in that sense, to love it as well. Uh, this brings me to something I have been um, uh, uh, stuck upon that like in in various kind of uh, uh, yoga practice um, uh, the balance balance which we breathe which we breathe has to come down to body like so yeah yeah so so and that is that is what the sadhana sadhana means the practice is to bring that balance on on the body otherwise it's just a time pass if you are not able to bring that then it's just a something uh, not of worth so yeah. otherwise it's not the practice of yoga so yeah. so it 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 connects me to that that thought very strongly, and yeah. um, I something again again from my experiences which stuck to me. And uh, when when you guys are talking about the the vaccine, right? So so, so the, the the vaccine is one solution, um, uh, one known solution, right? Uh, and we can say that yeah sure it will work because no we know like we eliminated india eliminated polio because we do, we did a very good job of vaccinating kids uh, on time uh, uh, but that is the one solution like t we know till now right uh, um, for an example a uh, lot of lo lo lot of people in the world eat uh, uh, frozen food and it has impact on the body uh, but but there if if you enter into a different different yogic practices you cannot eat frozen food like it is in your practice to serve your body so you cook or collect fresh food as a part of your practice you know you you spend time in it like consciously with so so it is nice that everything is, is is connecting because how much we care for our bodies i feel that is in 
in in question of collective uh, psyche or also at the same time for the earth as well like how 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 much we care about the body of the earth like hemisphere is 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 polluted right because like something touched it like a mold on the sandwich which we are supposed to eat something like that kushbu um i yeah. have a question so a lot yeah. of a lot of psychotherapists right now are having to do all their sessions via zoom or facetime or on the phone and that's what's mm -hmm. been contributing to the fatigue because they're hour mm -hmm. after hour they're having to work with patients you know just by like the the the, the screen and just the, uh, the another body is not in the room with them and it's you know that novelty of having your yeah. session in person is gone so this is what's really been mind blowing for many clinicians and therapists and i think that there needs to be some sort of like authorization for both the patient and the analyst both the patient and the therapist to almost like practice some movement together even though they're in different t spaces but to mirror each other in some sort of a i don't know like a yogic stretch yeah intermittently yeah. in between their sessions so that they're they they are experiencing their body and remembering that they shouldn't just sit there looking at the screen like that you know maybe sitting on the floor mm -hmm. and so i think something needs to like be put out for that to 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 help clinicians you know maybe sit on the floor maybe you know get comfortable stretching and moving the screen around and you know things like that i have my my apple watch that reminds me to breathe every hour <laughs> Joss, do you have some thoughts? Joss is our duty psychiatrist here, and um, she lives in Honolulu, so it's very early in the morning for her. Uh, but she has been joining us pretty regularly, so go ahead, Joss. Oh, aloha, everybody, and thank you, um, Dr. Paul Bishop, for such a wonderful, you know, opportunity to meet you and hear your thoughts and. I'm just sitting here like a butterfly on a wall, just soaking it in and just enjoying um, all that you have to say. And thank you, thank you, thank you. It's just such an, a joy. And um, I totally agree with your theme for today about, you know, um, what we had before is not normal and we're going into um, a new like paradigm shift in consciousness. Um, collectively so I think it's a, a beautiful opportunity really um, right now and um, yeah doing the same thing over and over again is pretty insane so <laughs> we welcome change um, good or bad uh, it doesn't matter because for one thing um, wh whichever path we choose we all um, go down the same highway and uh, we get closer and closer to the consciousness uh, in touch with our own consciousness and awareness of their our inner god so mm -hmm. it's all good so that's mm -hmm. all i have to say uh, but the main thing is thank you so much well thank you very, thank you very much indeed for those uh, for those kind of remarks uh, that's that's much appreciated um i've been, I've been glad to come on here and um and, and glad to have this uh, this 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 conversation so um i i can say the pleasure has been uh, been all mine is, is there anybody else who hasn't contributed so far who who has a comment to make yeah we cynthia do you have something are you still here where is she she disappeared oh there she is she has nothing to say nothing, nothing to, to say Okay, thank you. And um, Mirz, do you want to ask any questions? No, but maybe I have something to add, like uh, an autistic view on the situation, because I am, I am autistic, and I have felt since I was a child that <laughs> everything around me is insane is madness but as i was alone on that maybe the insane was me <laughs> uh, 
anyway, um, I always, I've always been the weirdo between my family, friends, uh, school colleagues, and now work co colleagues, and and now I'm I'm seeing everyone forced into a lifestyle that I would voluntarily have, uh, and I maybe. I see, I, when I talk to my, to my parents and to my sisters, I see how they are struggling much more than me about having to stay home. And uh, uh, they are all very festive and they love being together. I don't, so I, I was, um, well, I am a bit of an alien in the family and um, I've heard that my my sister who lives in Manaus, Amazonas, uh, a place where the health system has collapsed, she and all her family is uh, with symptoms of COVID-19, and uh, they they couldn't get tested, but um, they they they. They are. They they have the, the the disease. And when I uh, I remember that when in 2011 when I went to visit them, uh, I didn't want to 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 travel because I don't like traveling. I remember that I've never felt more like an alien than when I was there, because uh, not only because they they are festive and they like loud music and they they like to be together all the time but because when i expressed that i didn't i i, I don't feel comfortable uh, with that they, I, I i felt like they were getting me to dissect my body and study because they couldn't understand why someone wouldn't uh wouldn't like wouldn't enjoy what they do and there is to me there is no problem on enjoying partying and and getting together a lot but they were really uncomfortable with me even I, w I was there I was trying to be uh, uh, part of the group uh, I don't know if I'm being clear uh, I was tr trying to make the effort to not being uh, um, uh, the effort to be to join the group, but they were uh, really uncomfortable with my with my presence. So what I what I want to say is that it's interesting to see that uh, I'm. I don't know. I I have that vision that 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 normal wasn't normal, and that um, I'm not talking only about the the their, the way that they live, but about the way society was uh, is is built built and working, and somehow I. I was hoping that <clears throat> I'm sorry I, I have to stop and think a bit before before I go on um, that uh, I'm sad that this had to happen to make the world think about the way things were going on but I'm hopeful that when things when this uh, get in control maybe uh maybe please someone help me i don't know how to to finish the sentence um, maybe people uh, um i so appreciate your perspective on this because it seems to me that all of us should have that kind of an attitude because uh as jung reminded us every time we express who we are as individuals. It's an act of violation against 
the normal. And in order to step away from that very narrow expectation of what is normal, we have to declare who we are. And the, the beauty of your perspective is that, that you have been able to adopt that as your way of being in the world. And I think that is just really beautiful because we are actually all in that position where we like to pretend that we fit in with everybody else. But the fact of the matter is we're all a little bit weird and that's the way we are designed to be. And as soon as we can say, yes, I'm a, I'm a weirdo and, and I don't really fit in. And that's the way that God created me to be. And I'm living that out. I think that's a much healthier attitude than trying to pretend that, Oh yeah, I'm just like everybody else and I'm normal. Yes. Go ahead. Um, it is really difficult to me to, uh, to, to pretend, you know. Uh, it's difficult to me to go to work every day. Now I am in home office and I, I think if it will be more difficult to me to go back. Mirtis, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I never quite understood about Dr. Jung was that he always said about America that it's such an extroverted country. And, you know, what I think about this duality of extrovert and introvert, uh, I, I have a very simplistic way of describing it, which is an extrovert goes to a party and is in with the in-group and is telling jokes and having a good time. But an introvert is over in the corner, and I'm a very severe introvert, so um, is over in the corner talking to one person. Both can be happy. Um, and, um, you know, in my lifetime, because I got uprooted so many times, I, I never did fit in. I mean, for, uh, in my growing up years, I didn't fit in because I was always in a new environment, uh, every year or two. And I would always just be quiet over in the corner for the, like the first 10 to 12 months I was in a new location because uh, I didn't know how I fit into this new environment. And, you know, gradually I would get, get folded into the group and make my contribution. But um, always I was over in the corner, you know, just trying to understand how to fit into this new environment. And I think all of us, to an extent, um, you know, suffer that when we get uprooted. And, and so we have a lot of people who've been in the yuck yuck group in the middle of our party for uh, decades now. And all of a sudden they've, they've all been pulled out of that party and they're over in the corner trying to figure out how they fit into whatever is new. And it, it's it, for, for you and me, it's not so difficult. I mean, we, we haven't missed a beat basically, uh, in, in this situation, we're still having our conversations that we've always had, but, uh, but for people who are, have lived the extroverted life, it may be very difficult, I suspect. And Paul, I, I'd be happy if you'd comment on that. Um, well, I was gonna say, um, what do you call the person who stands in the corner talking to nobody? Um, I, I think that's probably me. So that must be the the extreme introvert, I suppose. Um, uh, and uh, and and to say to to, to Tim, um, well, if you if if you want to be weird and feel you don't fit in, um, become an academic, and you'll find that's that's exactly the career that uh, that's that's designed for you. Um, I, I I I think these are all difficult issues. Um, uh, the question of how one how one copes with working from home from uh, from from going out um, I, I certainly find as far as as as, as teaching is concerned uh, was, uh, it, it's simply not the same to be to be doing something over uh, over a link um, to actually being that three dimensionality that you have there and the fact you pick up so many cues from people you get you get a sense of a mood of a room and so on and, and so on and so forth um, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering because um, 
uh, as, uh, as, 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 as things have moved on here, if we want to find some kind of closing words. Um, and um, I was wondering if um, I just draw your attention um, the extraordinary chapter in the uh, uh, in the Red Book called uh, The Three Prophecies. And I did a little flick through and it and it fell open at this uh, at, at this page. Um, uh, partly because I think it is one of the most uh, uh, terrifying chapters that's in the Red Book, which has lots of terrifying chapters in it. Um, and so it's good to it's good to use the Red Book as a, a kind of stoic exercise of you know frightening yourself to get to get some practice in before life gives us something frightening. Um, uh, and of course, it starts off in the Three Prophecies um, with uh, the soul um, uh, going down into the depths yet again. Um, and, um, and it finds all these um, extraordinary objects, um, uh, uh, lots of weapons, lots of old uh, things which are falling apart, uh, uh, the teeth, bones, things from prehistoric fights and, and, and so on. Um, uh, it finds uh, evidence of natural catastrophes, sunk, shifts, uh, uh, sunk ships, uh, destroyed cities, um, uh, evidence of plagues, well, so that's interesting for our, uh, for our time. And, and it also finds um, the treasures of all uh, past cultures, um, uh, uh, wonderful pictures of the gods, beautiful temples, rolls of papyrus and, and so on. And Jung's response is quite magnificent. He says, this is a world. It's, it's, it's almost a quote from Faust. Uh, this is a world. He says, its extent is something which I'm unable to comprehend. How am I meant to assume all that? And of course, I think that's partly our question, isn't it? How are we meant to assume all that it is that's going on at the, uh, at the moment? And then, um, as a way of showing, um, uh, showing us how we should interpret it, um, uh, the, the, the text says that uh, what the soul had given Jung was three things. Um, and we think we've got it bad, but um, uh, look at the three things that Jung's been given. Um, uh, the, the, the sorrow, the, the distress of war. Thank goodness we don't have that going on at the moment. The, the distress of war, the darkness of magic, the gift of religion. What an extraordinary set of things that are there. So we've got Jung offering something really big ideas, war, religion, magic. So all kinds of big scale stuff that's going on there. But, but then what interests me is that as this passage unfolds, uh, uh, he says, uh, my spirit is unable to understand such terrible things that are going on, but he has a solution to it. He says, I'm not able to give it to you. I can only tell you about the way of what is to come. Very little that is good will come to you from the outside. Well, that's true enough. Uh, today. But, but what is coming for you, that is within you. That lies within you. And what is it that lies there? And I suppose that's the question we have to ask ourselves. What are the resources, the inner resources that we find ourselves being able to, to draw on? And then, and, and then Jung is quite magnificent. He says, the future is to be left to those who inhabit the future. I am going back, he says, into what is small and what is real because that is the great way that is the way of what is to come i am going to return to my simple reality to my simple undeniable smallest being i think if that isn't a great take home message for us as to what we're to do um i don't know what is awesome paul thank you so much tim did you have any last words uh Man, I do not want to follow up that statement. That was just brilliant. I just absolutely love that. Thank you so much, Paul. It's, yeah, it's been thanks delightful to have you here. And, and I, I really hope that sometime you can come back. Yeah. Uh, I love that very much. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're welcome to join us anytime, of course. And, uh, uh, and we have a tradition of closing our Closing our sessions with a, a mantra, a Sanskrit mantra that Kushbu has given us. And so, if uh, you don't mind, we'll pass it over to Kushbu to close out the session. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Kushbu, you're up.
we pray for the well being of all the people of the world and well being of of all the world ah bless you thank you everybody thank you kushbu god bless you and once again thank you so much paul for joining us today i really appreciate it i'm i will be uh, posting this conversation on youtube um within the next 24 hours or so right. well thank you very much and thank you very much for the invitation skip and um, thanks for everybody for the conversation i've i've really enjoyed it and learned a lot thank you thank you Take care now. Okay. You too. Right. Peace. Right. We'll, we'll see everyone tomorrow. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.